young people. So Johnny always told me George Grokko. Yeah, I got to be like at least like 12 years old and be able to sing in order to sit by a drum. There are two at the Porcupine home base in Pine Ridge and then since What's your spot back, Doug? Henry Green oh, Green Crow yeah. lived in St. Paul and then Jim Clemens. West kind of eastern. So, uh, um, oh, it, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm back, oh boy. Uh, so, uh, your, your name's Tom, right? I'm afraid so. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, you've been, you know, involved in, uh, you know, fights kind of similar to this for a long time, right? Yeah. Can you describe a little bit of your background, how you got into doing this? I blame Winona LaDuke. Minding my own business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I was uh, Red Lake mm -hmm. hired me for their solid waste officer mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. A lot of the tribes in Indian country did not have an environmental protection program, which was environmental racism issue. Why is it that the federal government since the early 70s uh, provided uh, uh, funding and capacity for state governments to develop uh, their own state environmental protection programs and to uh, develop their own laws and regulatory systems and what they call to receive delegated authority from the United States to operate their own state governments. So somehow in the early 70s they completely left out tribes. You know, so we have to really ask, why did they leave, leave out tribes and all the millions of acres of land on the, in the lower 48 and then Alaska? That's because there's a lot of our indigenous territories are rich in natural resources, minerals, and trees. Um, so, you know, my, my paranoia is that I don't think the government really wanted to have the tribes to develop really strong environmental protection programs. They wanted to be able to have a situation where these big multinational corporations could come in and basically open up contracts, mm -hmm. negotiated contracts, and there's no one to really advise the tribal leadership. Mm -hmm. So the states have somebody at least to advise them. So. Uh, a maximum of economic exploitation without any kind of accountability. Yeah, you put words in my mouth. I said that. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so that that became really a big issue in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. That there is a disproportionate amount of uh, toxic waste incinerators, toxic dumping, landfills, mining in Indian country, and people of color. So and back it, then we found that there, there is racism in how federal laws do not protect people, including native people. It's, it's been amazing for me to see how many places like oil refineries are always located next to the poorest communities, next to the native communities, next to minority communities, yeah. never, you know, in the nice white suburbs. It's always... They always seem to concentrate those kind of dangerous facilities that put out carcinogens and all that kind of thing. Did you read the articles? I say the same thing. Thank you. I'll interview you. And so, um, uh, what do you do? You see that there's more signs of awakening that there are. How you doing? Watch day. Watch day in Chicago. So, um, so you know, so that's when I went to work for the tribe, mm -hmm. close up these landfills, get money to do that, and then, uh, and during that time, you know, it's a big issue in all the region five the tribes and environmental protection. We have to fight to get the U EPA and the U.S. government to, to help tribes develop our programs. It was my first tier of activism working with the tribal government to develop tribal environmental programs. So my work became kind of well known in the state. And then uh, 
were just writing a ceremony and, yeah. and that's when Winona came up from yeah, the, like, this big meeting in Washington, D.C. in 1991. Mm -hmm. It was the people of color, environmental justice leadership, the where they're going to talk about environmental racism, environmental injustice. I thought we were the works here, but I don't do national mm -hmm. work. I told her that <laughs> this right here, the sweat line, I was getting ready to run the sweat line. So. But she convinced me to go to D.C. But it was good because I met all these elders and youth, and uh, they're all concerned. Issues like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that got me after. I know both worlds. Okay. I know the white and the white and the white and the white. That's how I got involved. And then I met some people that had forming this organization and indigenous environment and that okay. suits people. And so they recruited me to help them to develop it. So that's how I got involved. And so you traveled quite extensively and so you've seen a lot of different uh, places and sites where the same type of pattern has happened. Is that true? Yeah, the same pattern. <laughs> so, um, well, I guess the question is, like, do you see some, like, after all these, you know, years of working on this, do you see, like, some sense of traction, like, some sense that people are waking up, like, these efforts are starting to make a difference, that things are starting to change? Well, just when you, you make, you have some successes in one issue. Like my mom, she, she's Navajo from Arizona and New Mexico. Um, it was our youth that formed an organization called Black Mesa Water Coalition. And uh, they started to focus on water and uh, the aquifer <coughs> was being depleted by this decades of uh, mining of, of coal. And um, so uh, they had success in shutting down that mining company when they wanted to get a renewal of their permit to mine. It became uh, a tribal issue. That's where the government stepped in because politically it was an issue they have to protect their water. So the sacredness of water became a big issue. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we have successes like that, there's another hot spot pops up someplace else in North America mm -hmm. that we get involved and help communities you know, to have the knowledge and the capacity to get involved. Mm -hmm. We believe in the principle that indigenous people speak for themselves. So a lot of times they don't have information. A lot of times tribal leadership don't have information. Uh, so so uh, it continues. Mm -hmm. It does continue. Like the tar sands. This big uh, operation, industrial complex called the tar sands. There's no intention of 20 corporations to shut the valve off. And, but you look at the environmental destruction, and it is destruction. If you ever go up there, you see the, the big open pit mines, and the devastation to the water. There's the Athabasca River that flows right there. There's toxic holding ponds that are leaking into that river. And then the provincial government just hides it with glossy reports. You know, even the, the, the Canadian president, the prime minister, Stephen Harper, you know, he tries to hide the reality of the human health, the human rights, ecological damages, pollution of water, and the major contribution of greenhouse gases. That's one of the cont contributors of uh, climate change. Canada signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. but they have failed to fulfill the commitments of the Kyoto Protocol because of the tar sands. Mm -hmm. So we're facing, we are facing an industrialized complex that has no, it just really has no sensitivity and has no interest in protecting Mother Earth mm -hmm. or protecting the rights of human people. Money is the bottom line. But we do strategy, try to strategize how do we change that mentality. Yeah, th and that's what I wanted to ask you. What, what kinds of strategies and tools c can you bring to some community that you know, just has everything arrayed against it. What what seems to work? Well, the number one thing is for Native well, people shoot, shoot. to understand and to have information. Because there's been too much of a pattern where we don't have full information. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of the whole generation of 
<laughs> the whole generation of, uh, of uh, historical trauma. So you, you overlay, you overlay all these different things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Like for an example, some of my in-laws are from Red Lake. So the, I think the trees, you know, people know the trees, there's a relationship to trees. So when you see trees, like, right down, I think there's some kind of psychological trauma, spiritual trauma to that. We haven't really figured out a feeling and a language for that. If we have historical trauma that goes way back, then we have these kind of issues that triggers things. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not just something that happens in a closed circle. There's cross cross cutting issues for a lot of our people. Mm -hmm. That's what I find all over. Whether it's out the west or north. One of the men here works with that historical trauma and healing. You know. And uh, you know that it it, it 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 festers inside here. Mm -hmm. And then how to deal with these things where we have to have confidence to step up and to speak out for something that, that we feel needs to be expressed. But after not only decades, but over a hundred years of just being beat up, yeah, just being beat up literally by a governmental system that says, you have no voice, you know. Mm -hmm. you know that, that's the thing, it's how to get confidence for people. So, uh, do, do you feel that it, it, it is possible to, to make progress unraveling these relationships of colonialism to, to, to get, the, to try to take apart this system? Do you, do, you, do you see, have you seen it work before? Yeah, it has worked. You know, we, we've kind of been doing this for almost 22 years. The one thing that has been the foundation of our, of our resistance is our spirituality. You know, it's part of that given our community the, you know, the ability to lift up our spirituality. Because uh, we all have a spiritual foundation, many tribes. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I can remember struggles we had in California. Uh, there was a toxic waste dump, and toxic chemicals being dumped in this community in San Diego, near San Diego. And um, so we all supported them because they wanted to have a ceremony that night. And it was a Christian revival. Yeah. And that gave them the strength to, to come together. So it's however the community defines that. Many of our communities, there's a fire. That's why this fire revitalizes our spirituality with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the blessings of the Creator. So that gives us strength. We find that that's the foundation of strength for our people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that allows mm -hmm. us to really to shut down some companies that happen in Montana. The uh, Zortman Mine, Gold Mine. I remember the company was just beating up the Grovan people and the Cinnaboyans at at, uh, at Lodgepole there. And uh, if you look at that mountain at Fort Belknap, some people have been to the powwow there at Hayes. That's right south of uh, uh, the agency. There's a little mountain there, and you go up that creek between this like cliff. You go up there in the valley of the mountain, and they have a powwow up there, a well-known powwow in Montana in the summertime. But all the sediment from that creek is uh, contaminated with cadmium and all this from the runoff from the melt, the, the mine tailings. If you look at the top of that mountain, it's been cut off. You know? So uh, when we were there for one of our protecting Mother Earth gatherings, uh, about 1,200 people came from all many tribes. And uh, there's a medicine man there named Joe Iron. And he speaks both the Sinaboin and he speaks Grovan. And uh, remember he came and he asked all the people to get the tribes, he said, bring out your bundles, bring out your, your pipes, bring out whatever you, your way of praying, he said. And come out, he says, uh, we'll have a meeting in about an hour. And there were a lot of people that mm -hmm. brought out the sacred items. And he conducted a ceremony so everyone prayed and put that spiritual power to strength. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
those parts where you can feel it. You can feel the back of your hair rising, goosebumps, and many different denominations, not done only in our own tribal ways, but Christian ways too. Mm -hmm. Everyone praying. And, and, and there's something happened after that. That was in August, and uh, right at the end of August that month. Uh, Something unexpectedly happened. Even the ones, the white and barrels that have worked on mining issues, it surprised them. That company went bankrupt. Just like nice. that. Nice. And they had to close down that mining company and that mine. They were even surprised. And, uh, I believe it's the power of prayer that shut that down. Shut that mm -hmm. yeah. So in our indigenous movement, it has a spiritual foundation. But also, we understand the white man politics. We understand economics, shareholders. So some of our uh, tactics is to have shareholder campaigns. We go to where the annual general membership meetings are, and we bring native people from the community to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So all the shareholders want to know why are these Indians here. So we tell them why they're here. And a lot of them don't know that the company that they're a shareholder of is uh, creating doom and destruction. Mm -hmm. Mordor, Mordor is alive and well. You know? it certainly is. So that has worked for us, a, a, a corporation divestment campaign, shareholders campaign. That's one tool. Then other is non-violent direct action. Mm -hmm. Like this is a direct action. Mm -hmm. Going to Washington, D.C. and standing with Bill McGibbon at the 350.org putting a human rights face to the issue. So that's those are the mm -hmm. tactics that we have used. Um, th there was a, it was called a, the, the Mother Earth Accord, I think, that was uh, signed a, a few weeks ago. Is that is that the right name? Uh, well, the, the, the new treaty. Um, two, two treaties. Mm -hmm. um, one of the strategies for the Trans-Canada Pipeline was to uh, unify the elected tribal leaders the tribal chairmen and chairwomen and presidents of the upper prairie land and uh, so we were able to work with them and their lawyers you know and uh, we developed uh, the mother earth mother earth accord and that's a statement of rejection of the trans canada keystone xl pipeline and rejection of the tar sands and to stand in unification with the <coughs> native people in the tar sand sacrifice zone um, mm -hmm. and supporting them to stop the tar sands. That's what the Mother Earth Accord, that's a year and a half old, that statement. Uh, and then recently we had a, a Hunkdawa, Yankton, Dakota meeting of unification, bringing some tribal leaders from British Columbia, fighting pipeline, the same pipelines. But Inbridge goes going west to British Columbia. Mm -hmm. with the Northern Gateway Pipeline, and there's First Nation Indigenous people fighting that. Just like here, they're fighting, camping out. Mm -hmm. And uh, south of there is the uh, Kinder Morgan Pipeline uh, that's going to be bringing the oil to tankers to go into the ocean. Mm -hmm. they're, they're fighting to stop it. So this brought leadership from there to, to South Dakota, and there was a unification treaty that was signed, and then also recognition of an old Pawnee treaty with the Yankton Dakotas, the Hunkamans. Mm -hmm. So that's the strategy where they're, they're working with Punkas too, and they're going to uh, look at uh, all the cultural sacred sites in Nebraska. This corridor of pipeline, you know, it, it's our charge in our organization that that the government has not added to the inventory, the, the cultural resources, you know. All that was Indian territory before settlers came. Mm -hmm. They lived all in that area. So how do you know that there's not artifacts there, or sacred sites, things like that? They have to be protected, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of the tribes don't have resources to really do a comprehensive cultural resource assessment. Mm -hmm. And that's environmental you know, disparity, that's environmental racism, that we haven't been able to really have the capacity to really explore these. Mm -hmm. you know. To even know what you even have. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
So, um, would you say then that it, it really, it really is a, a multi-level strategy of resistance from things like a local direct action with, you know, red leg people and their supporters and a thing like this, all the way up to this, to the international system, the highest level of geopolitics with treaties yeah. and states and sovereignty. And is it just basically about trying to awaken people and get all those levels kind of turning at once? Yeah, it's, uh, we're bringing people to the United Nations to file human rights charges against these governments and to, to file human rights charges against these corporations. They should be allowed to get away with human people, you know. But it's strange that we, we have a colonial system, Canada and U.S., that doesn't recognize the individual and the collective rights of, of, of tribal nations. Mm -hmm. Corporations mean? have more rights to protect themselves than people. Yeah. What's wrong with that system? And this this corporation, this you know, this Enbridge Corporation, we we are on a piece of land which is not, you know, the same as conventional, you know, United States sovereignty. It's 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 a tribal sovereign piece of land. It, it was ceded uh, back to the, to the tribe in like a in a I believe in a formal agreement shortly after this pipeline was built, and yet still they can keep profiting from the operation of this pipeline, which has. Zero, p several pipelines on this parcel that have zero legal basis to even operate here, and they're dangerous, and and they leak on a pretty regular basis. It it's just shocking that that can be overridden, and that that you know that they can't just you know force you like you can't force them to just open the door and like pull the lever and, and turn this thing off. They're, they're operating illegal right now. They have no right of way sign. There's no documentation in the county records. But yet they lied. They lied on a on a uh, another uh, media team that was here that interviewed <coughs> one of their representatives. And that representative said, "Yeah, we have uh, agreements." But as they interviewed this representative, uh, she's starting to stutter and starting to uh, contradict earlier statements. Yeah. So we have a tape on it. Yeah. It's posted on YouTube, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, but in, in my experience with working on these issues for over 20 years, these corporations, the bottom line is money. I like to say that it's not, but it is. <laughs> As you go up the chain of command, you talk to the senior attorneys, the CEO, you know, the bottom line is money. But here in the community, we get some of the nice people. They send nice people to us. And they develop friendship, and we say, "Well, hey, they're not that bad." But I've seen the ones at the corporate offices; they don't give, they don't give a damn <laughs> about human rights. They'll even say that off the record. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't give a damn about human rights. And it's it's so difficult, difficult, and problematic in the Western world that a corporation is legally obliged to be psychopathic. It is legally obliged to place profit above damaging anybody you know beyond the boundaries of the law it's like they're obliged to damage as many people as possible if they can get a single dollar from it well, and that's like the fundamental organizing way of our like whole western society well yeah. the western society i mean it's not surprising to me because it re reflects a society of people that have lost their identification to the sacredness of mother earth and that goes way back into their old world there were, there were, in fact, battles over there, mm -hmm. fought by kingdoms. The kings needed to have control of the land. So when they had people that had tribal traditions that talked like a lot of our people talk, you know, they're really threatened by that when they are confronted with these populations and settlements and villages of people that have a deep spiritual foundation to Mother Earth. It's kind of like the umbilical cord. They have a, a tie to Mother Earth through the songs, through language, through ceremony, through teachings. The people over in Europe had that. But there were Christian crusades. There were battles to destroy and to sever that relationship because you cannot get to the full control of the land. It's always been control of the land issue to sever that relationship. Mm -hmm. 
and replace it with another form of worship. I'm going into some deep stuff here. Yeah. Because when you have a society that don't know what the relationship is to the sacred of Mother Earth, then they end up being controlled, you know, by mm. corporations in this case, <laughs> or governments. Um, so it's centuries so of no alienation. Ethics. There's no mm. ethics mm -hmm. behind what their world is. There's no original instructions. There's no teachings. The faith-based group we feel when we network with them as allies, the closest that they come to understanding what we talk about about our relationship to Mother Earth is reciprocal relationship. Hold on. Is stewardship. Stewardship. But stewardship is still a form, form of ownership. Mm -hmm. It's part of dominion of the sacred. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a system of alienation, yeah. just with a different goal in mind, but, kind of. But eventually they're going to come full circle to understanding what we understand. So when we have a society of people that understand the importance of Mother Earth, that's why we're part of a big global alliance now to, to uh, teach the dominant society about the rights of nature and the rights of Mother Earth, you know, because the whole system we're fighting is based upon property rights. That's mm -hmm. what corporations have property rights. They have property rights who easement set this up. Do we have property rights? When our land is held in trust by a colonial government, mm -hmm. we have BIA always there looking looking over what we do. You know, we're we're the we're the uh, you know we're we're the ones that they take care of. The BIA has two responsibilities. One is to is to uh, care for or to be the trustee. I mean, the truster <laughs> over our people. You know, they have the BIA. You know. And then others to develop the land, mm -hmm. you know, introduce clear cutting, you know, rather than select cut or whatever the sustainable force. You know. mm -hmm. Whatever can make the most money in the short term. Yeah, that's yeah. just how it gets laid out. Then we end up fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. You know, internalized oppression. We have internalized the way of the oppressor, so they don't even have to do anything. We just battle our own now. Just it, it just replicates it, kind of like a like a fractal. It's patterns of different levels. It's just the sort of same pattern over and over. So part of this resistance here is decolonization. Decolonize ourselves, yeah, and speak for ourselves. Tito and others are here learning these things so that you know, so kids like this will get to understand. You know. So that's it. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That really lays it out. Let me use the uh, paper in your window. Paper? Yeah. Newspaper. I need a couple of that we put in the.